Hello, my name is Dr. Patrice Evans and I'm Deputy Head Teacher at Chorney High School for Boys. Hello, my name is Mark Mailer and I'm an Assistant Head Teacher at Chorney High School for Boys also. And the title of today's presentation is When is the best time to plant a tree? Now, I know that sounds absolutely bonkers, but stick with us and all will be revealed. So Mark, when is the best time to plant a tree? Well I can't claim any originality here, it's actually a Chinese proverb and actually the answer is 20 years ago. Yes, and the reason being it's all about protocol and it's all about practice. In other words, not one go, but constant repetition. Alongside regular review and refinement. We've recently had a Section 8 inspection and I must admit we are all incredibly proud of what we've achieved. So what we'd like to do is to share one or two key points that they made during that inspection. There's one that Mark is tremendously proud of. So Mark, what's that one? I believe the one you're referring to is the quality of education at Chorney High School for Boys transforms pupils' life chances. The quotation that I like is that leaders act quickly and decisively to maintain high standards. And I think why I like that is because that word leader has been redefined over the last few years. It's not just about SLT, it's about all the middle leaders, it's about subject leaders, it's even about student leadership. In this case, they're focusing, of course, on the teachers, on the adults, but that's absolutely brilliant. But what I like also is the fact that it's a reminder that these things take time. We actually need time to grow, time to develop, time to implement our practice. So how did we achieve this? Well firstly it's about whole school practice and we'll unpack this more later. Again too it's about developing leadership at all levels and I'll talk about that after Mark's session. And it's a whole new world. How do we deal with unforeseen circumstances? You know what that sounds like a song. Uh, if you behave yourself, I might just sing for you at the end. So what we'll do, we'll look at our whole school approach to our reading strategy. And I'll talk you through the, the steps in terms of uh, planning and delivery. And the steps will be identifying the need, both intrinsic and extrinsic, situating as a key priority in our school improvement plan, communicating that vision to staff and stakeholders, and then most importantly, testing the impact. And we'll look at grounded theory, whether there's a, a cultural shift in our ethos, uh, something practical like an uptake in our library uh, usage, and ideally we're looking overall for improved reading ages. Now, as a middle leader or a senior leader or aspiring leader, the tendency might be to rush headlong into any given strategy. And your first port of call might intuitively be to actually go to your development plans within your own department or whole school development plans. Now, we would say at this stage, hold off. There's quite a few things to do beforehand and we'll talk you through these. If you notice on the picture, you have a tree. That's fairly obvious. What you will also notice is that the root structure is larger than the mass above. Now, this is a very keen observation in terms of our leadership. You need to build the basics and the basis first before you can see growth and fruition. And that root structure starts with identifying a need. Now, that need might be an internal one or an external one. Now, in terms of our reading strategy and our particular context, we work along the lines of a very particular number, which is 9.3. Now, 9.3, according to research, is the minimum reading age that you need in order to access the Key Stage 3 curriculum. So our internal need was to ensure that our boys all have a reading age on or above this. The external pressure that we all face is not based on context, it's Ofsted. And you only have to look at the new education inspection framework and the handbook 
to see how many times the word read or reading is mentioned. And there was a very clear read through from the inspection framework to the report that we received for our own uh, Ofsted inspection in December. The next stage is to ensure that it's situated within the school's improvement plan. Leadership has to come from the top, the vision must come from the top to drive this through. Now we're ready for the development plan stage at Middle Leadership. Be sure on your plan, no matter what your format is, that it's very clearly linked to the school improvement priority. You don't want to be a lone wolf. Then be very clear about what your intent is, what you hope to achieve from this strategy, and be very, very clear about what this will look like in terms of implementation. And one final piece of advice is for your impact, try to be in terms of uh, projecting what the impact will be quite specific. So try to avoid generalizations such as improving reading. It would be much better if you reduced uh, the amount of students who had a reading age below 9.3 by 50%, for example. So try to give specific, so smart, smart targets and smart impact. Now the key measure uh, and indicator of the success of our strategy was, as we've said before, our Ofsted inspection this year. And I'll just give you a one line from the report, which is, you successfully promote a love of reading both in school and at home. So there is a very clear read through from education inspection handbook and framework to the actual Ofsted process itself. Recently, we've been afforded a rare period of reflection. And upon making a video about our reading strategy for uh, EduChat, we had the opportunity to film the vast array of strategies that we have put in place around the school. Now, we have a little challenge for you now. That video we made, we're going to speed up to some degree. And your challenge is to see how many strategies that you can spot, let's say within about 50 seconds. Well, that was difficult. Some of the things you may have noticed might have included teachers sharing what they're reading via posters on their doors, the library being at the very epicenter of the school building, wider reading across the curriculum, and reading aiding transition between key stage two and three, and whole school reading projects, starting in year six and continuing in year seven. Of course, the true measure of impact lies with our stakeholders, whether that be our students or our parents, both of which have been captured here in our core offer. We invited a, a range of parents into the school to ask them what they understood by the Chorney ethos. We did the same process with our students, and it's great to notice that situated at the heart of their answers was the recognition that reading is a critical part of life at Chorney. There is one caveat to this, of course. We can plan, 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 but we need to adapt where necessary. Now, I don't need to go into a great deal of detail in terms of what's happened to us over the last few months, but we've had to radically change our educational landscape. And if you look at our core offer to support home learning, there again, very clearly, is reading situated right at its heart via our e-learning resource library. All of this will hopefully keep you ahead of the curve. Now, the curve we have in question here is the sigmoid curve. And it's the notion that if you are on a trajectory of success and progress, 
if at a critical point you do not adapt and refine, then the curve will start to ebb off. You need to improve constantly, constantly building time to reflect and refine. Okay, Mark, finished? Hi, Patrice, yes. Okay, cool. So we might as well summarize some of these things that were said. The first and most important thing is ensuring that you have whole school priority and you're very, very clear about ensuring access for all. Secondly, sharing the responsibility. And what we've done is we try to outline quite a few things here for you to pick up later on with your teams. But lastly, the most important thing is sharing the practice. No one person holds the answer to every single question. So it's about working together and that's what I'm going to pick up later on in my session. There's an absolutely lovely quotation that I remember. Diversity is about being invited to the party, but inclusion is being asked to dance. And that's what we did as a school. When we thought about our vision, we worked with leaders at all levels. We got opinions from students, from teachers, from middle leaders, from even outside of our school. And by talking and collaborating, we shaped the vision. Secondly, we listened to different voices. It's quite important that if you're asking everybody on that journey, that everyone has a voice. And lastly, we work together to ensure the practice. And that's important. Okay, Mark has just spent some time outlining how we took one school priority and moved it from inception into practice. But the key message you have to remember is that it takes time. I'm going to show you an image here on this screen. It's so important that I've had to use the same image four times. So tell me, what have you noticed? Yeah, you're right. The people are interlocked, aren't they? And that's because the key message is we need each other. So very often as leaders, we feel we have to do it all by ourselves. And I, think I can see why, but that doesn't work. We do need to work with others. And most importantly, we need to ask questions. If you don't know what to do, you've got to ask. And that's another key message I'd like to share with you. There's quite a big difference between taking the overall lead on something. That's important, yes. We often want to get it so right that we forget there's a wealth of experience around us. So it is important to tap into that experience. Is it okay to ask questions? Of course it is, come on, you know that. You've got to ask questions. And that's why in this section of our presentation, I'd actually like to share with you some questions that were asked, but more importantly, I've invited some of our colleagues to answer those questions for you. So let, let's just take a look. Um, let's see what we have here. Uh, okay, good. The first question is, how do I get my team to agree a vision? Now, that's a good question. Having a vision is so important. And I do remember that during our own offset inspection, the inspector noted that leaders of all levels were able to check regularly how students were performing. That could only work because they shared a vision. Now, even though it's important to have a vision, I suspect one of the greatest difficulties is sharing that vision when you're leading a variety of disciplines. So what I've done is I've invited Mr. Henry Cross, who is the head of humanities at our school, to talk to you about how he works with geography, history, and RE to share a vision. How we shaped our vision, our being the key word here, because having a vision is the easy part. You also need to take people on the journey to fulfill the vision and for that you need shared commitment from your team in order to achieve it. Collaboration is key here. There are instances where a new head of school or head of department arrives and announces their ready-made vision without consulting staff or students, the context of the school and doesn't take time to hear the ideas from members of their team. In all likelihood it will be an uphill struggle from there. So collaboration as I said on a shared vision is critical as is commitment in order to see your vision through. Now commitment does not necessarily mean consensus. However, if the team has the trust and they engage in serious, passionate debate and everyone participated in the conversation, commitment to the ultimate decision becomes much easier. This shared vision will then form the backbone of your department development plan and intent going forwards. As the references suggest, it gives drive, 
passion, energy towards positive change, and it brings people together. Before considering our vision as a faculty, we have to consider the overall school vision, and this then informs our thinking and must act as a guide to ensure that we are in alignment. As a faculty, we have a separate vision statement for each department, but we always meet together to begin with in order to share and collaborate so we can produce an overarching humanities faculty vision statement. This will ensure that we have key points for our vision embedded across the faculty. This was a vital exercise to get everyone on your team engaging in what was really important to them, to motivate them and get them passionate about what we are trying to achieve. I've taken some snapshots here from our shared humanities vision statement to show you some of the key threads that are embedded within each department of the humanities faculty. I'm just going to pause for 10 seconds to give you time to read through these. Key focus points agreed by the team included developing strong subject knowledge, a range of extracurricular activities to support cultural capital, dynamic retrieval methods, reading, a focus in higher education, creating global citizens and inspiring students to understand and make use of the powerful knowledge we were teaching them. Signposting through evidence-based CPD, evaluation, monitoring and continued collaboration are key to keeping the vision prominent in your team's mind. This is also why it's so important to ensure the school vision guides your team's vision because whole school development and training will lead and support this. This has manifested itself in different ways across key threads identified in our vision statement. I've highlighted some examples here. Becoming global citizens through geography's work to become approved by the British Council and become an international school with links to schools in Africa and Asia. Secondly, a focus on inspiring students to engage with humanities-based subjects based on the powerful knowledge that forms our curriculum uh, and brought about from engaging students and parents in the humanities achievement evening. Thirdly, we worked hard on creating more extracurricular opportunities through a range of trips, but also internal clubs such as reading and history film club. Dynamic retrieval. This allowed us and departments the flexibility to design regular impactful retrieval strategies throughout their curriculums. Next, a whole school approach initiative to get us signed up to the Prince's Teaching Institute supported our faculty in signing up for a range of rich sessions to develop our subject knowledge. Reading has become a much more integral part of our curriculum by not leaning away from reading challenging texts and lessons and engaging with scholarship and reading clubs after school. The effects on team morale and the profile of the faculty has had a huge lift as a result of these achievements. The tangibility of what we have achieved and reflection make it possible for us to see how far we have come on the road to achieving a vision set out nearly two years ago. The benefits of this shared vision are far ranging, but I've tried to neatly summarize into five Ps. First of all, problem solving. Having a shared vision can help with problem solving. Whatever barriers you encounter, if you know where you're going, you can work backwards on that to figure out how to solve that problem. Secondly, purpose. A shared vision gives your team a purpose, a drive and a belief in what they are doing. Third, prioritize. A shared vision gives you clarity. Schools are very busy, teachers always have 101 things to do, but the value of a clear vision and the process of generating it is that you can strip out all of the activities that are not really working towards your vision and prioritize core issues. Will strategy X make a difference to getting where we want to be? If the answer is no, it's a good reason to drop it. Diana Asiji has a great method for tackling this with her mic method. M being maintain, I being improve, and C being change. We use this to evaluate how we're getting on as a faculty to make sure we keep on track with our vision at regular intervals throughout the year. Next, process. Vision is a process and it takes time. It's not something that happens overnight and it can take a cycle of three years to see any lasting impact. And finally, picture. The big picture is vital. During the process, you may well suffer setbacks, such as exam results, audits, or Austin inspections, but maintaining that big picture helps you to absorb those setbacks and keep you on track to your final vision. It's so important to recognize that we are all strong individuals. We take time and we take care to employ strong individuals because we want to drive that vision. So we're not always gonna agree on every single thing, but we can, however, agree on being committed to the learning of our students. And it's that commitment that helps to shape the vision. Okay, cool, thanks Henry. Right, here's a second question. My team is a mix of experience. Should I take a risk and give them responsibilities? Do you know what? During our inspection, the Ofsted inspector said that we had established a culture in which all leaders were able to work very well together. So I think what I'd like to do is to introduce you to Ms. Lillian Wiggle, who's the head of mathematics at our school. And she will talk you through how she managed to spot potential 
and use distributed leadership to encourage her staff to develop. Hi, as Patrice said, my name is Lillian Wiggle and I'm the head of Mads at Chorney High School for Boys. I am glad Henry was able to speak to you about sharing a vision. There is an old African proverb which recommends how any vision can be implemented. It states, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. This is so very true in life. Within schools, we work in teams, whether it's as forms, houses or year groups. The same is true of departments. And as team leaders, we want to do well and we also want to do what is best for our teams and students. But with the best will in the world, we cannot do it alone. You simply can't. And if you did, your staff will feel you don't trust them and nothing can be further from the truth. I believe that if we have spent time shaping a vision together, then we must work together to implement it. Every member of the team has a strength that can be used to improve the learning experience of the students. Even if they don't know their strengths, I make time to work with them to find out. Let me show you what I mean. Take a look at this image. What have you noticed? Yes, they are working together. I've never seen a man build a house by himself. On the building site, someone is responsible for providing the materials, another for shaping key aspects of the structure, and others for refinement. The same is true of a department. If you have worked on your vision together, there are clear aspects that need to be developed, fortified or celebrated. Through the use of distributed leadership, I am able to develop my team and support them when implementing our shared vision. Distributed leadership recognizes or builds expertise. In fact, distributed leadership is also referred to as leadership by expertise rather than leadership by role or years of experience. Genuine distributed leadership requires high level of trust, transparency and mutual respect. In very practical terms, to be most effective, distributed leadership has to be carefully planned. It won't just happen without any thought. I trust my team and having worked hard to build this trust, I am more than happy to create opportunities for members of my team to lead us all, including me. By doing so, we share the workload and successes. The success is not just my success, but our success. Here are an example of what I mean. Within this grid, you will see we have recognized the need to, one, Monitor KISA 3 data to identify those students who might be falling behind and implement targeted first wave teaching strategies. Two, ensure students' efforts are always celebrated in meaningful ways. Three, support students' cognitive learning by creating and evaluating the use of retrieval status when teaching. Trial with identified groups, monitor and feedback to the team. Four, identify the extent to which student leadership can be implemented within lessons and evaluate the impact on class Y. We discuss this area as a team and one of two things might happen. Someone volunteers to work on an area that interests them. This means they take full responsibility for ensuring this aspect of our department's development plan is implemented, monitored and evaluated. In doing so, time is also provided within department meetings for them to lead in this area. Two, the second way is that I suggest they take on this responsibility. This can happen because I have noticed a particular strength of theirs in this area. Or I might feel after discussion with them that this could be an area of development and challenge fitting for staff of their level of experience and expertise. Regardless of reason, we always discuss how a strategy might unfold within meetings. Although they lead on this area, we all find ways to support the member of staff responsible. I also lead by example and I'm just as accountable as anyone else to members of my team who have responsibilities. Michael Jordan, an iconic basketball player said, there is no I in team, but there is in win. So I would recommend employing distributed leadership and working as a team, a winning formula. Thank you very much, Lillian, for reminding us to look for the potential. Very often we wait to see if the person grows into the job, but the reality is they can't grow into the job if you haven't actually given them the task to do. So I think it's important for us to look to see where the potential lies within your team and perhaps use some of what Lillian did to help your own team grow. Now that's one extremely helpful way to develop your staff. There is another though, 
and I'd like to invite Mrs. Quick, Nicola Quick, who's the head of English at our school, to talk to you about how she managed to share good practice among her team and in doing so develop subject knowledge. Let's have a look at how I guide and lead my team to enhance their subject knowledge. This is a key focus of our team improvement plan, which is always in line with the SIP. We want to ensure that all teachers within the department are building on and enhancing their subject knowledge to have the confidence to teach all language and literature content for both Key Stage 3 and Key Stage 4 to ultimately improve outcomes for key groups of learners. As is the case in all teams, all members bring their own experiences and skills to the table. It is vitally important to ensure that these are celebrated and promoted to allow for the utmost development and success for the team. This will ultimately lead to the most successful teaching and positive outcomes for pupils, which is fundamentally our collective reason for doing what we do. Everyone has their own jigsaw piece, but as is the case with any good puzzle, these pieces aren't always made obvious to you. You have to go in search for them. Sometimes people are even unaware of their own puzzle piece they possess. Our department has an open door policy based around trust and mutual support. Learning walks, observations, drop-ins and book scrutinies are strategies often found within departments. Previously, the default position for these techniques was to find improvements that could be made in pedagogy, even better ifs or targets. However, when we changed our stance and purpose for these monitoring techniques, a gold mine was soon found. When we changed our focus and made it about celebrating practice and learning from each other, a more positive atmosphere was created within the team and a culture for sharing good practice evolved that is helping to ensure that all staff feel supported and are effectively developing themselves. Based on the observations or conversations from that week, a team member offers to share this practice at our next session, which we have called Learn to Learn. I always try my best to ensure that a rotation of who is presenting is in place, as it is important that everybody shares their puzzle piece to contribute to the bigger picture, regardless of whether they are a trainee, NQT or more experienced member of the team. So when and how do we share this good practice? We want to ensure that rather than waiting until the next scheduled department meeting, we have a regular time to work collaboratively to implement all or part of the new strategy in a timely manner, as well as having a designated time for the precious commodity of talking and discussion. The department meets each Friday morning before school where possible for their weekly learn to learn session. We ensure that this is a much more informal setting than other department meetings and often all team members contribute to a communal department breakfast which is enjoyed alongside the sharing of good practice. This safe and supportive environment lends itself to ensuring that staff confidence is also built. The staff member in question delivers a short presentation to demonstrate the strategy that was observed and highlighted that proved to be successful with regards to pupil progress. The remaining members of the team take a golden nugget from the session. It might be that they implement the strategy like for like, or that it sparks an interest where they go away and further develop this for their classes. The impact of this strategy has been extremely positive. Not only has it significantly developed the confidence of staff, but it has also allowed them to have a sense of self-worth and importance when it comes to whole department contribution. The collaboration time is also something which is of great importance for all members, especially at the end of an extremely busy week where often the days fly past and time for professional development conversations with others may have been minimal. It is made clear to staff that although the strategy worked for that member in question, we aren't asking them to necessarily copy and paste the strategy into their lessons, although sometimes that is appropriate. Instead, we are asking them to think which part of the strategy they might wish to take into their own classroom or adapt to best suit the needs of their classes. Sometimes the power of thinking, reflecting and evaluating is just as important. By ensuring that all members have a chance to show off what they have been doing, we are also utilising distributed leadership, which Lillian has already shown is working incredibly well in her department with great results. 
Since starting the Learn to Learn sessions, we have now extended this strategy where we have paired teachers up based on their strengths and areas where they can develop confidence. These pairs act as peer coaches who conduct their own informal observations of each other, as well as often becoming marking and moderation partners. As a department, we have found that as a result of this strategy, the department development plan and individual performance management is now much more at the heart of our daily practice, which in turn is ensuring that we are developing ourselves as practitioners on a weekly basis and delivering consistently high quality education to our students to ultimately provide them with the best chances of making significant progress within the subject area. Thank you so very much, Nicola, for reminding us that we're not competing with each other. It's so good to learn with each other, but also from each other. Now, what I'd like to do now is to take a look to see what other question we have here. Um, okay, question number four. How can I maximize learning and add value so all students benefit? Now, I know the perfect person to answer that question. And he is Mr. Chris May, who is the head of PE at our school. He's going to talk to you about adding value. The first point I'd like to talk about is building value in your subject area and how the access and the opportunities that you provide within your subject can ensure that students attribute value well beyond just the examinations and that there are lots of ways in which you can build value in your subject area and promote a real love of learning for the students. And some of the key ways in which we've managed to do this are listed here below. As a leader, knowing what drives your staff is really fundamental in this process. And this would seem obvious to us as leaders, but do we know which areas of our curriculum really get our staff going and motivate them to teach? Because knowing this can really help us to guide them in sharing that passion. And I know this sounds simple, but managed correctly, this will create lots of opportunities, both to develop provision for the students, but also in developing the skills of your staff within your department. Do the staff in your teams have equal voices? Does the NQT feel as empowered to contribute to discussions as much as the teacher say who's been teaching for 10 years? And how do you as the leader manage those conversations to ensure that everyone feels equally valued and contributes fairly. And we've already seen some great conversations within this presentation about distributed leadership and sharing good practice. And this is a really key component in building provision within your teams. Does your department provide opportunities for students to access um, your subject outside of curriculum time? And as a leader, how do you view some of the whole school commitments that you might be required to satisfy? Now, let's take an example such as running an inter-house competition. Do you see that as something that has the potential to distract your staff from concentrating on their classroom responsibilities and something that's merely a tick box exercise? Or do you see it as a shop window for students to really love your subject in a different way and actually a chance for someone in your team to really have an impact? And do the opportunities you provide offer access to all students? Now, all of this is underpinned by effective performance management. And for some, this term can bring around some quite negative thoughts and feelings. But the way we as leaders frame these conversations and generate our objectives can have a real impact on how motivated your teams are to develop the provision. In school, we use this process as a way of celebrating the work of staff. And each year within the department, we complete a 360 degree review. Um, you can use tools such as the SWOT analysis or Diana Asagi's MIT principle to help you really identify as a team areas of provision that you might like to develop. Now, this process provides an opportunity for you and the team to identify areas which means staff in your team all of a sudden will begin to take ownership over any potential documentation that might come out of these meetings, such as team improvement plans. And having staff members who are motivated to enact change in the areas that they have identified 
will have a huge bearing on the overall impact of any projects or plans that they implement. And your role as a middle leader is to ensure that you coordinate this process effectively to make sure that as well as giving people the power and the platform to drive the change themselves, it's coordinated in a way that still meets the needs and the priorities of the department moving forward. And this is where we come full circle back to knowing our staff. And as a head of department, you'll need to know which members of staff are likely to see those opportunities really clearly and know how to take them. You'll need to know which members of your team are likely to need reassuring that they can follow an opportunity and they do have the skill set to follow it through successfully. And finally, you'll also need to know which members of staff maybe need the encouragement to spot that opportunity at all. If you are interested in accessing some more CPD around this topic, there's a fantastic session by Dr. Evans on what it is to be an outstanding head of department, where she goes into a lot more detail about some of the points that I've made in the presentation. And there's some really rich information and some great golden nuggets that you can take away with you to incorporate into your own leadership. Um, this can be accessed via YouTube if you just search for the Chilton TSA LD EduChat channel and you'll be able to find it from there. And I really would recommend that you take some time out over the next couple of weeks to, to watch that video. So finally, what we're going to be look, looking at is the impact this may have in your subject area. Now, over time, this process will hopefully foster a culture where the people in your team are continually seeking out opportunity. OK, and this could be to develop provision within your subject, but it also could be to develop provision across the school. And your staff move away from just being the expert practitioner in the classroom. They're the people who provide a sports journalism club or a chess club. And they're the people who provide opportunities for students to love your subject. And students who love their subjects demonstrate improved attitudes, improved behaviours, which can only be a good thing. So the question I'd like to leave you with is how can you and your team develop provision to promote a love of your subject beyond just curriculum time? Thank you very much, Chris, for showing us how empowering staff and harnessing their passion can add value and generate opportunities for all students. That's so important. I know with NP, it's so easy to look at those who might have the skills, you know, they're quite athletic or they like rugby or football. But what about those who don't um, like those sports? What about those who struggle a bit on the field? So it's good to see how the P department through Chris's leadership has managed to harness all of that so everybody is able to contribute and everybody is able to participate superbly. Thank you very much, Chris. Good. Now, um, there's one more question here, I think. Yeah. Question number five. Okay, I like this one. Um, they keep asking why we have to learn all of this stuff. Isn't that great, that word stuff? Good. Um, how can, so how can we help students to see the link between what they're studying and the real world? Well, what I'd like to do is say, mention that within our inspection, they stated that students were able to see the relevance to future careers. And they were able, because of that, to aspire to do well. And one head of department who's done this superbly is Ms. Neelam Zulfika, who is the head of business studies at our school. She's managed to work with her team to show students a link between what they do now and the real world. I'm excited to talk to you about how I lead my team to shape the wider curriculum to support learning. One of the things my team and I agreed was access to the world of work. One of my favourite singers summarises this quite nicely. In my travels all over the world, I have come to realise that what distinguishes one child from another is not ability, but access. Access to education, access to opportunity, access to love. By access, we mean at the heart of every meeting, we explore together how to support students to become the best learners within our subject. Skills they should develop in a business studies lesson should be skills they can take into the workplace. What we do know is that business studies is a subject that every young person in one shape or form will interact with in their lives. 
You can't escape business, and that's the kind of philosophy I like to build in my team. If we know they can't escape business, if we know that they will all work in an organisation that will function as a business, then they all need to know and understand and develop skills that are required for the world of work. Part of my quality assurance with my team is to ensure that there are regular activities such as Dragon's Den, bringing in external speakers, visiting workplaces and bringing to life institutions they would have heard of like the Bank of England and Canary Wharf. We are showing students what they are learning is not in a vacuum, it is to support their access to the world of work. Of these, some can be deemed gimmicky like Dragon's Den events, but these events are incredibly important for developing students' confidence and their ability to design an idea and articulate it convincingly. It draws on students' communication skills, on their thinking skills, their ability to analyse data and information and decipher what is most important and how they can deliver that to an audience. And in addition to that, they learn how to work in teams. As well as this, looking at an organisation and consulting and coming out with recommendations as they would do or implement. Some of it also involves actual live trading. How can you really do business studies without that in the curriculum, without them actually selling something? It may be muffins over a break or lunchtime period. It may be something more creative than that. But what we know is the wider curriculum aspects outside of the specification really brings that subject to life by working with my team to bring speakers in from outside, people from industry, to talk about the various roles within the industry. Also, for them to have an appreciation for the vastness of careers available out there in the workplace and the world of business by taking them into workplaces and seeing offices functioning. Some of that is also around raising aspirations, but it's about bringing that learning that they have in the classroom to life, and that is the absolute fundamental. The wider curriculum is there to bring the subject to life, and that is what I endeavour to do with my team in every lesson. I work with my team to ensure students are confident in the knowledge that our subject supports students' life skills. Dr Evans asked me for my top three tips as a team leader, and what I have to say is collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. The members of my team are also senior teachers, but it works because we talk. Thanks, Neelam, for reminding us about that key word, collaboration. So collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. I can't say it often enough. And that's what works when you are working with a team. If you're leading a team, you need to think about the team and work with everybody to be able to support them effectively. So thank you very much for listening to my colleagues. I hope that they've managed to answer some of your questions and you found their responses very helpful. Remember the key idea here is that this journey takes time. Everything that Mark spent time outlining took quite a while. It didn't just happen in one day or one month or even one year. In fact, I will say that even though you might feel it's a finished package, we're still evolving. There's so many things that we've done within the last three months that are so different from what we've done previously. So don't beat yourself up. It takes time. Now, Michael Jordan said something quite interesting. And in fact, I don't want to get it wrong. So excuse me if I read from my screen. He says, talent wins games, but teamwork and intelligence win championships. Now that's so critical. We all want to be champions. We all want to do well at our job. So why not look around you? Why not take a look at the schools where they've got things right? Why not take a look within your own school to look at other departments to see what they're doing well? As teachers, come on, admit it. We are scavengers, aren't we? We are always pinching the best ideas. So ask questions, pinch ideas, but remember your school, your department, they're both unique. So if you take an idea from somewhere, make sure and tailor it to suit your needs. But remember, take time. Hello, Dr. Evans. Hey, hi, welcome back. Thank you. Oh, good, good. Now, you'll be pleased to know that we don't have too much longer to go, so just bear with us for a little bit more. Okay, is that okay? Okay, fine. Right, this last section is, it's a whole new world. Seriously, it's a whole new world. And you've got to be willing to adjust. We've just experienced three months of COVID, at least within this country, and we've learned so many new things during that time. 
So that alone shows that you can actually change, you can actually adjust to suit the situation. So we have to rethink what's necessary and reprioritize. We've all had to embrace and adopt the role of technology, for example, in our pedagogy. Now, regardless of what you do, how you do it, which resource you use, you've got to trust your team. We are all parts of teams. In fact, some of us are parts of two or three different teams. So teamwork and trust, those are critical ingredients to success. Um, you know what, Mark? I just said it's a whole new world. That sounds like a song, doesn't it? Um, should I? Listen, can I sing for you? Seriously, I can sing for you. No? Okay, right. Now, to be honest, all jokes aside, if you just look at the words of the song, it's a whole new world. What do they say? It's a new, fantastic point of view. It's good. So come on, let's embrace those opportunities. Let's work with things around us. Let's work with people and let's succeed together. So just to reiterate our initial sentiments at the start of our presentation, it's all about daily protocol and practice alongside regular review and refinement. I hope you've enjoyed what we've had to say and I hope you found it extremely helpful. What we might do is actually put one or two slides at the end of this presentation and those slides will have links to, let's say, CTSA's YouTube channels. This is where, for example, Mark talks about, what do you talk about? Reading culture <laughs> strategy. <laughs> okay, yeah, he, he really does. He talks about reading. And you'll get a chance to see lots of images on how to implement that strategy within school. And I speak about leadership. I look at the role of the outstanding head of department. And that's critical to, to our environment right now. So, thank you very much for spending time with us. It's good night from, actually not even good night, sorry. It's bye from me and... It's goodbye from this. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.